The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. This is Sarah Luger speaking from the Gold Standard Foundation. I'm the Director of Communications. Um, I'm just waiting for perhaps maybe 30 more seconds to allow um, a few others to join, and then we shall get started. Thanks very much. Sarah, this is Sumi. Can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay, it looks like we have a, a, a great group on the line, and in the interest of time, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks again for, um, for your interest in attending this webinar, where we'll outline the findings from a market assessment that Gold Standard has recently concluded with the um, gracious support from the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. I'll start first by Stepping through the agenda of what you can expect for today, um, I'm joined by uh, my colleague Sumi Mehta, the Senior Director of Research and Evaluation for the, from the Global Alliance. Um, Sumi will talk about the challenges and benefits of clean cooking technologies and, and really outline where the impetus for this, this study originated. And then I will um, rejoin you and, and really go over the, the core of the content, which is outlining how we approach this market assessment, um, and most importantly, what the uh, insights were that we found. Um, I'll start by looking kind of broadly at the trends and opportunities that we see in, in funding and driving finance to um, projects that support SDG impacts um, generally, and then we'll take a deep dive into a number of SDG-specific insights and, and draw out some conclusions for the, from there. And then we hope to have um, answer some questions from those of you on the line. So with that, um, Sumi, I will turn it over to you and allow you to take the floor. Um, sure. So, um, hello to everyone and thanks for joining. Um, we're very excited to be here and to be working with Gold Standard on this work as they continue to really focus on um, looking at support for um, impacts for a broad range of the development goals. I think many of you here on the phone may be familiar with the fact that there's still around 3 billion people who continue to live in households where um, the cooking and heating is done using either open fires or also some of the traditional stove and fuel combinations, as you can see in this, in this picture here. So, you know, this continues to be one of the um, the kind of the oldest developmental challenges that we've faced and one that unfortunately has not gone away as quickly as we would like to see. Um, if you see the next slide, please. Um, in fact, um, inefficient cook stoves and fuels are really estimated to be responsible for around um, about a quarter of emissions of black carbon, which of course is a short-lived climate pollutant of great interest. Um, but in, in addition to the kind of short-lived climate um, impacts. There are also great um, negative impacts on public health, on food security, global warming, um, ice and snow melting, and, and other um, related weather patterns that we're really um, concerned about. Um, and and this, is, this is really of concern, of course, a, a leading risk factor um, and source of, of ambient um, air pollution as well in many places. And we know that really black carbon emissions are the second most important contributor to global climate change behind CO2. So this is something that continues to be concerned um, from the black carbon perspective. Um, if you see on the next slide, um, this is really something beyond, um, beyond climate, which is really integral to achieving at least 10 of the global development goals. Um, so, that, so it's beyond the folks that are working on um, you know, specifically climate related issues, a lot of issues related to the environment, to public health, to gender equality and well being, which really, with one set of interventions, you can really achieve a range of the different goals. Next slide. 
Um, but as we think about this, it is really important to know that there are a range of different um, cooking technologies that are out there. And we have to keep in mind that what would be considered clean for health is not necessarily something that would be considered green for the environment. So the two cannot be used necessarily interchangeably. And really pleased that there's been so much work underway um, through the ISO standards development process and also through WHO's air quality guidelines to really help us clearly de de define um, the types of performance um, that could be achieved. Um, and so that depending on whether one is interested in health versus climate, you can really um, you know, select which of the technologies are likely to, to provide and maximize the benefits that you're most interested in. Um, and so really we were very interested um, through our um, membership with the, with the Clean Air Climate Coalition in really getting a better sense of building on some of the work that Gold Standard um, has, has done traditionally, which had been really focused on the traditional carbon markets to really expand beyond that, to look at really how we might think about driving funding um, to achieve the range of development impacts related to cooking and heating interventions. And so this is really an area where we're thinking about, um, of course, beyond carbon, the traditional carbon markets, looking at reductions in short-lived climate pollutants, um, looking at reductions, in, in reductions in, in health impacts and achieving public health benefits through exposure, um, reducing exposure to pollution, looking also at increasing gender equality and so the, the real interest in doing this work was to try to get a sense of, you know, if we're really thinking about um, looking at funding for development goals, you know, one, who are the potential buyers of these goals? Um, and, and related to that, what is it that they would really like to buy? Are they interested in buying a package? Are they interested in, in, in one goal versus another? And really, what are the different ways that we might want to think about packaging these benefits? Um, in order to get kind of maximum impact and also to have um, maximum funding available um, to kind of I I accelerate the sector as well. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Sumi. So um, just for, for those of you who are on the line who might not be intimately familiar with Gold Standard, just a quick word. Um, about us. Um, since our founding in, in 2003, we, we've, Gold Standard has really aimed at integrating climate action with development impact. So this has been kind of our raison d'etre all along um, with an aim of, of driving finance to projects on the ground and, and, and beyond that, ensuring that every dollar creates as much impact as possible. And that's something that it will be a kind of recurring theme throughout this presentation and, and throughout the um, uh, gold standards work generally. So as Sumi already mentioned, we, we have our, our kind of legacy in, in carbon markets. And so we've used carbon finance, which is really a results-based finance approach, wherein a project is implemented, impacts are quantified, verified by a third party, and then certified in this case by gold standard. And this is to unlock financial instruments, carbon credits, that, for instance, companies who wish to offset their emissions would purchase as part of their climate mitigation strategy. And, you know, this has had some good impact. Carbon markets have been a, a useful tool over the past, you know, bit more than a decade. And we've seen over time that, that volumes in the carbon markets have expanded over time. Um, but you, you also see that the value has decreased. Um, so we have a, a supply and demand issue that's putting the, these streams of carbon finance at risk to these really transformative projects. When you look at you know pricing, what what are these carbon credits commanding in the market? You you do see that um, I've highlighted here clean cookstove distribution, and, and you see that they they receive a relative premium. Um, at least in the voluntary market here, that's um, captured here, which is just over. $5 per ton in 2016. So compared to some other credits, that's not bad, but we were very quickly realizing that relying on this one single metric on the carbon mitigation as the value carrier and packaging these really truly life-changing and or in some cases life-saving benefits as co-benefits um, isn't really living up to the, the value that these interventions are delivering. So, I mean, even it's hard to even argue that the carbon benefit alone should be argued at, at $5. So we're looking at other ways um, to 
really um, monetize the value that is delivered by these projects. And, and you'll see a snapshot here um, that demonstrates that how we know that the impacts from cook stoves are not you know, just good stories or co-benefits, but translate to real social and environmental value. Um, this is a snapshot of, um, of project averages on, on the value delivered from different SDG impacts that based on a, a, a market, a, excuse me, a, um, a research study that we commissioned in 2014. And so you see here when you, when you quantify the environment, I'm sorry, the economic value of these different benefits, it's not even accounting for the climate, um, the social cost of carbon, if you will. Um, it's it's much much greater than um, what carbon prices or carbon credits are fetching in the market. So we're trying to seize this opportunity, and it was really the um, the impetus and the key drivers for for Gold Standard to develop and launch, which we just did in July, um, our new standard, Gold Standard for the Global Goals, which allows cook stove projects, among among other uh, interventions, to quantify certify and maximize their impacts to climate security, but also to sustainable development, to quantify progress towards the SDGs. With the goal of then moving beyond that single metric of carbon as the value carrier, and in this new paradigm, you can imagine crowding in multiple investors into a given project or intervention, depending on what that um, what that investor or what that funder is is interesting interested in realizing. So you can start to bring into the picture, um, for instance, uh, companies that prioritize health or gender that might not have been interested at all in buying carbon credits. Offsetting was not part of their a key part of their strategy. So how did we go about um, this market assessment? Um, that was really the starting point, but we wanted to test our assumptions and, and start to glean some new insights that will allow us to drive additional and, and new funding to these high impact projects. So we started um, as with those impacts that had already si had been signaled as early demand from our key stakeholders. So uh, Sumi mentioned um, e expanding beyond the um, GHG reduction to look at reduction of black carbon and short-lived climate pollutants, as well as health and gender. And the assessment was comprised of, of multiple kind of means of engagement, if you will. It, it was uh, an online survey. So that's the kind of quantitative research that will highlight a lot of the, um, the insights from during this presentation. But this was really supported also by one-to-one -one interviews with some key stakeholders. And um, we wanted to also cast a, a, a broader net by um, spreading the word through a number of webinars and supporting with desk-based research. So who did we speak to? Um, you'll see here that there was a large representation from the private sector, from corporates at 44%, um, a fair few government slash development agencies, a number of impact investors, and then some representation from development banks. Um, and the the 38% other influencers are comprised of um, other um, constituents like project developers, consultants, um, or NGOs, civil society active in, in climate mitigation. The geogra geographic representation um, skews a bit towards Europe, as you'll see, but we do have uh, had a number of respondents from both Asia Pacific, the Americas, and and at least at least that's one from um, from Africa as well. So where we started in this um, in this assessment was first to uh, test our first kind of key assumption, which is asking the question, are, are the SDGs truly relevant to a, a very broad range of funders, or is, could this be niche to, say, you know, multilaterals or, you know, public funders? So are we on the right track here? And, and we... We, we did have a data point, at least from the private sector, that um, we considered the World Business Council for Sustainable Development cited in their Reporting Matters, which is a publication on the – a report on reporting, if you will, on sustainability, um, that over – just over 50 companies out of the 163 that they evaluated, or that translates to about 30 percent, were communicating about the SDGs um, in their 2016 report. And our survey 
I think started showing that this this trend is continuing. We we asked, uh, is your organization committed to contributing to the sustainable development goals? And overwhelmingly, the response was yes. You see, eighty six point seven percent here. Um, and then, kind of moving further along that journey, then if you have made a commitment, have you already specified your goals, targets, and indicators? So, do you have a plan in place for tracking progress, which would be, you know, where our our solutions, if you will, would really come in? And thirty percent already said they had, and but but a large number, forty five point eight percent, said that they plan to. So. This um, it seems to be accelerating, and so I think we have a real opportunity to um, to capitalize on here as um, funders are increasing, or funders from a multiple perspectives are looking for quantified impacts. So, of the SDGs, which are the priority for their organization, and, and respondents were allowed to uh, mark more than one answer here, but you see very clearly that climate action is the most common SDG target, which was not a surprise, really, because it reflects its place as a more mature area of focus across uh, a number of different types of organizations, particularly with corporates. We're taking climate action is, is almost for a, a company that wants to be seen at all less sustainable. It's almost seen as a license to operate. And then you see that clean energy is not too far behind, that those are closely linked. Um, the SDGs that we were really taking a deep dive into, you see a, a pretty good um, distribution there, health and gender, um, were fairly well represented as well. So kind of confirming our thesis that um, the SDGs are relevant, then how do organizations want to engage? And, and we had a, a specific concern about the, the private sector here because of a trend that we have observed, and I'm capturing a, a screen grab here of a, re, a very recent um, study published by the Imperial College of London in Accroa, which is showing how companies are, are, are frequently looking internally, if you will, inside their supply chain, where their goods and services are being produced, manufactured, sourced, distributed, etc. Um, we were concerned that that trend would, would preclude uh, an interest in supporting cook stove interventions, which are in almost all cases, or at least very frequently, outside of a corporate value chain. Um, but what we saw is when asked um, that, we saw that 66.7% of those surveyed said that they would direct funding where the SDG impacts were needed, um, even outside their value chain. So um, that was a, a reassuring and um, kind of confirmed that we do have some space to to um, exploit here and, and presenting these even to companies that will still be looking at their value chain but will look beyond. So looking at you know how we're how we're um, the kind of the rigor required around what we've called historically co-benefits. Um, we were asking, the thesis we wanted to test was whether it was necessary to go to that extra step, which of course requires time and cost, of having these SDG impacts independently verified rather than just self-reported or being again packaged as co-benefits. But 80% of respondents felt that it was either necessary or good to have data that was already assured. Um, but the, I guess the next question is, okay, you want that, but are you, will you pay for it? 63% um, of respondents actually did say that they would be willing to pay a premium for verified data rather than that was just, that was just um, self-reported. And again, just a kind of uh, underscoring this is ICROA and Imperial College found a similar trend um, when they were looking specifically around um, those who are offsetting, that 81% agreed that it is important to have co-benefits uh, independently verified. So again, I think that was some um, affirmation of, of being on the right track. And then thinking back to that, that um, visualization of impact and, and translation to economic value, we were interested in what type of tools and, and what people, you know, is that a helpful, I guess, way to secure internal buy-in or ability to communicate to your stakeholders to be able to say, um, I have very 
uh, punchy graphics to visualize my data. And I also have um, dollar values. I have um, dollars in, in, in a metric to translate to what my kind of return on impact investment is, as you will. Almost everyone said that those two items would, would be either important or even called them a game changer. So the last kind of um, exploration I'll highlight here was around, you know, is, is results-based finance a viable mechanism for this? Or, are, we, are, are we, again, on the right track to be using the, the strengths and what has been successful from carbon markets and applying these principles to new streams of funding for SDG impacts? Um, just asking kind of an open question, we started there, um, almost... 90% of people did report seeing value in payment upon delivery of outcomes versus funding um, projects or interventions up front. Um, and then again, trying to push again on the a little bit harder and from a different angle on, you know, are, are you willing to engage beyond your own operations, beyond your own, you know, um, your, within your own walls? Um, almost 90% of respondents also said that they saw a role for their organization in climate finance, again, specifying that this is driving decarbonization beyond their operations. Um, so again, if you think about the climate impacts of short-lived climate pollutants, there's opportunity that hints that there's opportunity there as well. And then another um, concern we wanted either to confirm or refute or at least get a, some insight on was around the the I guess the competitive natures of, of funders in some cases that who might be interested in kind of owning their own intervention like they want to this is my project that I'm funding alone um, but what we saw is pretty clearly only a, a very small percentage uh, indicated that they would prefer having sole ownership of the impacts from a single intervention so there at least was not this funder perspective that would um, would prevent crowding in of multiple funders. So those were some interesting insights um, kind of at a, at a broad level. And now I'm going to walk through the, the SDG impacts that were the focus of this study, starting with short-lived climate pollutants. And I'll highlight first the, the methodology that's been developed um, in association with many of the organizations that you see in this slide. Um, <clears throat> The, the methodology is specific to uh, cook stove interventions, and what it, by applying the methodology, you can quantify, of course, you can quantify the reduction of black carbon and, and the rel related co-emitted species. Um, but what that allows you to do is to capture your the, the full climate benefit of an intervention. So if, if someone asked me, well, why would I go this extra step to quantify um, if I'm buying a carbon credit from this project, well, the answer is, is you're missing out on, on being able to really credibly report on the full climate impact of, of what you, of this, of this intervention. Um, so two questions we're, we're investigating as part of this market assessment is to query of how we can bundle this impact with others um, versus offering it um, separately. And also whether if there's interest in additional and new money new, um, to reduce uh, SLCPs. So when we looked and we when we started asking our questions, um, we wanted to see what people were doing today and where their interest lies. Um, we saw that a, a fair number of respondents, um, half of those who answered the question, which was over 20 respondents, said that they either had a strategy in place to reduce short-lived climate pollutants or had plans to put one in place. And I think this suggests a rising focus on SLCP management, probably um, very much to do with the, the, the good efforts of our um, supporters at the CCAC. Um, but of those respondents, only 10% had made public commitments to address LCCPs, and that's those the the primary means would be through, either through a we mean business or a CCAC pledge, um, and then to see what where does clean cooking and heating fit, figure into that picture, um, 
a total of 16 respondents, but only three corporates, we did look at that level of detail, um, specified household cooking and domestic heating in developing countries as the CCAC sector that they would be most interested in addressing SLCPs. And this was when presented in context alongside the other CCAC initiatives, which included agriculture, um, oil and natural gas production, refrigeration, transport, waste, and brick production. So I, we think this is due to a couple of factors. The first, which is generally a strategy would start, um, a, gen a strategy to reduce LCCPs would start within the value chain, as kind of alluded to before. Um, and those other initiatives are, are captured in those in, in those CCAC commitments. And then again, that secondly, carbon credits have, have been the primary vehicle for corporates to fund these household cooking and heating technologies. And, and black carbon and SLCPs haven't really been figured prominently among the co-benefits that, that most people have even talked about today. Um, so it, that shows an opportunity to, um, for education in that regard. Um, but moving to, you know, how is this, it, w could this be paired alongside a carbon offset? So you can, again, represent the full climate impact. Um, would, would the a survey respondents see value in quantification of SLCP reductions along the carbon offset? And 61% said yes. Okay, so if you are interested, um, are you more compelled by the climate impact that reducing uh, black carbon has or uh, the health impacts from reduced um, exposure to particulate matter. Um, you see here that there, that if someone was had a preference, it w they leaned toward the climate, um, but many were were interested in in both in both impacts equally. And so just to, to kind of draw out an insight here, what we're seeing and, and, and thinking back to how, uh, how Sumi had, had outlined um, kind of the, the different technologies and, and how they fit in this, in this grid here, we do see an opportunity for um, the funding of SLCP reductions um, in particular as a way to, to test and transition um, a, the communities, let's say, up the, up the food chain or up to, um, to optimal interventions for whatever geography and context um, is, that project finds itself in. So that's something that we look forward to uh, testing in project implementation and with um, a, a market development study, or I'm um, sorry, a market um, development strategy. And so I'll, I'll start now with those that from, again, from some of the highlights that I've mentioned here, there of course are more questions um, in the survey, but we're drawing out just some of the, the main takeaways. We've also used the supporting um, desk-based research and interviews to start to create some buyer profiles of, of who these buyers um, could be. Um, and related to the black carbon SLCP impacts, we see the highest um, potential with, uh, perhaps obviously, but corporates who have made those SLCP commitments and starting uh, as a priority with those who um, have purchased or um, currently do purchase carbon credits because of their familiarity with the intervention, there's less um, kind of uh, coercion, convincing needed. Um, so that's a that's where we say a good place to start is there's an opportunity just broadly with oil and gas companies and other kind of um, others in the value chain, the energy value chain, because of their a high negative impact um, around SLCPs that they um, are likely looking to to mitigate in some form or fashion. We also have drawn out Indian uh, corporates in India because of their uh, a federal requirement to spend 2% of profits on CSR efforts. And, and, and tied to that, um, the, the frequent air quality concerned in major Indian municipalities. So we're looking um, at you know, say Delhi and other municipalities um, in India that have cook stove programs uh, where air quality is a major concern as a, a way to to kind of engage um, local policymakers in funding such efforts. And um, 
having gleaned, learned some lessons from the Indian kind of uh, outreach, there are, you know, this could be extended to a number of other uh, countries, but uh, China is an obvious um, next priority. And through uh, through interviews, there was also um, underscored the, the Canadian government in particular because of their Black Carbon Fund. So that's the snapshot of, of uh, SLCPs. I'll move now um, to health, um, the next impact that we looked at. Um, and I think just to spend a moment here on the, on, on the, the, method, the methodology side of, of, for quantification, um, again, you'll see the, uh, many of our partners in the development of this methodology, which is the uh, ability to quantify the direct measurement of personal exposure, exposure of households to particulate matter, which is a, a prediction of morbidity and mortality rate um, caused by air, uh, household air pollution. And I think the real sea change here um, today compared to previously is that we're moving from correlation to causation and, and have a, a very um, specific measurement rather than broad claims around health and also a, a translation to economic value because um, health impacts, negative health impacts from cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, lung cancer, um, these can lead to disability and even premature death. Um, and, and this translates to real health costs to society and, and to governments. Um, so, what um, the claims that have are ha arise from that are real direct a funder that supports such an intervention and, or the, the application of a methodology would really be able to claim with precision um, progress towards SDG uh, 3.9, um, which is to substantially reduce the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals and air and others. And then specifically 3.9.1, which is the mortality rate attributed to household and and ambient air pollution. So this is, um, again, a very direct correlation to SDG targets and indicators and the translation to economic value and healthcare costs avoided and productivity gains are also a very compelling story, um, particularly to public funders. So in our assessment, we looked at, we wanted to see um, kind of get a, a snapshot of where people are today. So we have experts telling us that this is a, a strong metric, but is it going to resonate with um, with the funders that we might want to approach? So we did ask this question, um, does the disability adjusted life year, um, the methodology and the metric, is this, <clears throat> does this encourage you to fund projects? And not surprisingly, um, we, we had some who, who said yes, probably with the credibility of the, the, those who are behind it, but really the 63% um, couldn't say. And this, it, it, again, it's not surprising. I think it um, just emphasizes the fact that we there's a lot of education that needs to happen around um, the A-Daily's metric to bring it to more mainstream um, way to assess impact. And then to start to look at, um, you know, to be forward looking and to think about, um, you know, will we need to have kind of disaggregated data? We wanted to start just asking some, um, you know, primer questions around um, where it would health impacts be specific to a specific population. Um, but we see here that um, respondents really respond, said that they were interested in health impacts generally and not gender or age specific. And again, with um, supplementary kind of insights from research and, and, um, and interviews, we've highlighted um, the different types of funders. Um, the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry uh, are a, a prime prospect. Um, even more specifically, those who have respiratory products and, and, and or operations in areas with air quality issues allows them to tie um, their impact story more closely to their core operations and values. <clears throat> um, well, values aside, tobacco companies uh, that have supply chain operations um, in, cook in countries where cook stove programs are happening are also um, an opportunity. 
to try to um, again mitigate their uh, their uh, impact at, towards health and have a positive outcome. Um, private foundations focused on health. There are a number. Several include you know Hewlett, Skoll. We we know that. Uh, we understand that Gates is finishing a um, piloting an assessment of their own, so depending on, on those outcomes. But um, generally, those who are prioritizing health, I think we have a pretty compelling story to tell. Um, and then within the, even more specifically within foundations, those corporate foundations, um, like, for instance, Lilly, um, and the other, uh, another, um, there are a number of larger Foundations also focus that have a look at health impacts, um, as such as commodity traders and oil and gas, that have um, quite large foundations that might be interested in such an impact. Um, on the public side, we have um, drawn out OECD country uh, governments where, but in particular where there's already an awareness or perhaps even trials around performance-based payments. Um, in addition to those, those that are, who are, you know, really putting health at the top of their priorities um, or already have commitments to clean cooking and heating interventions, perhaps, obviously. Um, but beyond just the kind of traditional host country, or I'm sorry, the, the, the donor countries, um, we're interested in exploring the opportunity for some blended finance structures with the donor governments um, that aligning them with the funders, the, the funding governments that include those um, host countries and their development priorities to have a kind of uh, joint approach in, in funding impacts related to health, specifically because of the translation that it can be made to GDP. Moving from health to gender, um, which you can, um, some argue is, is uh, gender equality can be the one of the most cross-cutting and multi-dimensional and, and potentially even the most complex um, type of impact to measure. So when considering how to quantify impacts towards gender equality, we uh, Gold Standard and its partners, uh, many of again who you see here, um, began with a scoping exercise to identify which are the most relevant and potentially highest impact um, and most interesting to funders. And the result, um, just so you have a clear picture of how Gold Standard is approaching this, was a two-pronged approach. Um, one was to further strengthen gender awareness at uh, the requirements and safeguard level of Gold Standard for the global goals as a, as a standard um, to reflect you know, latest thinking and best practice so that all gold standard for the global goals projects in the future will be required to take special care to maximize potential benefits for men, uh, for women and include and be inclusive of them in their um, development process. But then on the impact quantification side, the specific metrics have shaped up to focus on um, those that you see here, which are women's economic empowerment, um, the reduction of time poverty, and women's voice and agency. Um, and just to note that this framework is currently in consultation until the 17th of September. And uh, also worth noting that we are looking for projects to apply this framework and be among the first to quantify their gender impacts uh, according to this framework. So if there are project developers uh, on the call, um, please reach out to Gold Standard if you'd like to pursue this. Um, but again, to looking at claims very, very closely aligned with SDG um, targets and indicators, specifically 5.1, 5.5, and uh, 5.4. When looking at um, how we started querying our, um, our pop uh, study population, we asked, again, starting with an open question, um, we asked the respondents to select the ways that they're interested in contributing to gender equality. And you see them listed here, and you see a pretty equal uh, representation. Um, so we, we did that to, to remove the, a bit of the, the survey bias, but, um, but based on some of the, the thinking among our expert working group, um, who had started to prioritize economic women's economic empowerment 
um, we we wanted to see if that did resonate. So do you, we asked, do you see value in economic empowerment as a cross-cutting approach for contributing to gender equality? And overwhelmingly, 92.3% of respondents said yes. And then further, so if you, you see value there, would you consider funding projects that demonstrated quantified benefits to women's economic empowerment? And again, the answer was um, almost, uh, was again resoundingly yes. Um, and, and asked a slightly different way, um, again, trying to uh, unpack whether these, these benefits would be best packaged together or, or separately. Um, we asked if a climate protection project that reduced carbon emissions also demonstrated quantified impacts towards women economic empowerment, would you be willing to fund these? And again, we're getting very positive responses um, to these questions. And so there's a real indication here that, um, that gender issues um, in general are interesting to funders, but also that uh, focus on women's economic empowerment has some potential to be, um, to be further exploit, explored. Again, looking at buyer profiles, um, Companies, as mentioned in the beginning, are really starting to come out and, and speak about what their SDG commitments are. And so being able to isolate those who have made commitments to gender equality, SDG 5, are, are very good um, target organizations. And those that um, have a prime audience um, who have women as their um, prime prospect, uh, such as household goods, um, fast-moving consumer goods and beauty companies um, where they're selling primarily to women, they, they often do have uh, their priorities around um, gender impacts. On the public side, uh, again, having explored some desk-based research on where OECD cover governments were focusing um, funding, um, we we're trying to look at the intersection of, of, of gender and health um, or of gender and economic empowerment. And you see that those um, countries listed here show that their development spending um, has an intersection at, those, at the uh, different permutations of those impacts. And then there's an increased um, trend towards a gender lens investing. So among um, impact investors, foundations, um, and even some multilaterals, uh, looking at those who are who are funding with a gender lens is a, is a, a good place to start. So that that concludes the kind of deep dive into the 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 SDG impacts that were explored um, or that we focused on in this uh, assessment. But we're we're very conscious that um, many projects in clean cooking and heating, in particular, really. Uh, and again, as, as Shumi outlined in the beginning, um, they deliver a host of SDG impacts. Um, so, you know, gold standard in conjunction with the alliance um, and, and many stakeholders will continue to explore um, potential sources of demand for SDG impacts like poverty reduction from reduced um, expenditures on fuel, um, potentially biodiversity protection or conservation from reduced pressure on forests and cons conservation of habitats, job creation, access to clean energy. So we'll continue looking at these, um, these impacts to, to see where, um, where there's opportunity for new methodologies and, and outreach to new funder types. Um, and just to kind of wrap things up on, on some of our key insights, and, and the first is that the, in, the SDGs are increasing, indeed, in relevance in many sectors. Um, and, and companies, organizations, even you know, investors are really on a journey. Um, I think many of them are, have identified their priorities or their process and, and really will be looking to, for ways to um, make contributions. And, and we're seeing that the importance about having very quantifiable and verified or assured um, claims is very important. Uh, it's also clear that that we have um, the opportunity to cast a broader net. That different funder types will prioritize different SDG impacts, um, and this can vary in region and sector as well. 
Um, we've taken away that results-based finance is viewed favorably in principle, that there is a good kind of um, reaction to it. But again, being conscious that it's been limited in uptake so far, we we appreciate that to, in order to scale, we need to um, embark on kind of a, a an education campaign about the the bounties of results-based finance. Um, and at the same time, ensure we're reaching out to, uh, to project developers to, to, to craft the right projects and opportunities to, to line those up with the funding opportunities. Um, and also we, we, we know that it's, um, that it's important that we don't lose sight of a way that we enable in a very easy and simple way for funders, um, we enable them to to report and communicate the, the impact that they've had to their stakeholders. So we definitely have our eye on this, and, and we're trying, we're looking to take the that um, kind of uh, economic valuation exercise to the next level, um, so that we can uh, really translate value. Um, we can help. The numbers people understand what um, what value is really being created through the protection, um, you know, through positive health benefits and from empowering women, um, and uh, these and reducing SLCPs, everything that we've talked about today. And I think um, you know the, our next steps are really to um, to take those insights I've just outlined and and create um, not just the materials but also the strategy for outreach and and, and that'll that will um, create opportunities and, and will require in fact um, many of you who are on this call to to join us in doing so and and will continue to um, to work with the CCAC and the alliance um, on a market development strategy to help. Um, make these insights truly actionable so that we can really make uh, go from niche to mainstream on um, on quantification of verified impacts to really drive a transition to uh, to a climate secure world and also one that um, can provide development opportunities uh, to communities everywhere so with that um, I would like to conclude the presentation and at this point, I'd love to have, um, let's see here, sorry about that. I'm gonna, hopefully you still see the slides, but let me, um, at, at this time while I'm getting the, the slideshow view back, you can use the ask a question function to, to share your questions with us and we'll try to answer them as best we can here in the session. And if we're not able to answer them today, to loop back with you following um, following the session. And, and one thing, just to note, we will be um, we will be sharing the slides and a recording of the presentation for you to share um, with uh, you know for you to refer to and to share with your colleagues. We're also developing a full report that um, that will be published to the Gold Center website and, and certainly through our partners' channels that captures uh, everything that we've gone through today. So with that, um, I will like to, um, I'm starting to review some of the questions. So if you'll bear with me as I review them here. So three quick questions. The SDGs are pretty much connected to the NDCs indeed, which are part of the compliance market. How do you see voluntary and compliance market in the present and in the future in terms of helping investors to build a green portfolio for their companies and ultimately attend countries reduction target? Where gold standard fits in this chain and where can you change help car carbon pricing around the world? So yes, that's a that's a very good question and one that we've been giving a lot of thought to. You're you're absolutely right that these have um, a, a close connection to NDCs, um, at least in many countries, um, and but also to the SDG to the development agenda of of, of many countries. So um, we do need to we do indeed need to engage. Um, at the national and subnational level, 
Um, but r- related to compliance markets, I mean, as we see the as we see the 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 rules or the negotiations around Article Six in the Paris Agreement um, taking shape, um, we're very conscious that um, many gold standard projects, many voluntary market projects generally, um, will be at risk for double counting. Um, last year, our CEO, Marion Verl, had published a policy paper um, where we've outlined kind of the core principles of how we see the voluntary market um, being represented in post-2020 schemes. And A core element of that is being able to quantify the GHG reductions without necessarily issuing carbon credits. So that, in fact, what what I've described here today in using a results-based finance approach where you're quantifying impact and assigning that to a funder, let's say, um, can be done also with uh, with GHG reductions without necessarily having to trade carbon. And the claim would then become one to have financed emissions reductions rather than to say that I, you know if i'm a company that i'm carbon neutral uh, i've helped a country finance uh, finance uh, emissions reductions and meet its ndc target so that's how we're looking um, that's how we're looking at things in in terms of compliance and, and future markets if you will There were two other questions baked into that, um, but I'm going to try to, in the interest of time, try to look at um, another another question. Um, Will projects that generate other verified non-carbon outcomes be able to unbundle these non-carbon outcomes? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, What what will need to happen in those instances? I mean, that's really what we're, we're trying to get after here is um, to allow in that, you know, in that example that I outlined in the beginning, um, there where uh, you might have the, the occasion where one organization is funding the, the climate impact, one's funding the gender, one's funding the biodiversity potentially in the future or um, the health. Um, what, what will be required there is a very clear communication and um, management of claims. Um, so that these are are these impacts are assigned to a funder very transparently um, in a public registry, but also um, disclosed to other funders, so that there isn't the impression that someone's contribution is leading to um, all of these impacts, but rather the same pr- the same principles of what we call additionality in carbon markets would apply in order to monetize an impact individually a project would have to demonstrate financial need to apply that methodology in order to be able to um, isolate those impacts for a specific funder. Um, Is there an estimated price per A daily? Um, That is another great question. Thank you for that. Um, This has not... uh, we don't have an official view on the price per a daily, but the guiding principle is two to three times GDP per capita. Um, so that will vary uh, regionally, but that's um, that's something to be tested further. But that's kind of the prevailing wisdom around um, a daily's pricing. Let's see. Lots of questions coming in. Thank you. Um, from, we see that we find that successful older voluntary market project is an excellent starting point for an article 6.2 project. So that's really building on, um, on my comments, uh, previously. So thanks for that, um, Tim. Um, let's see. There is a question around um, A dailies are not recognized as a metric by the UN SDGs. What would it take to translate GS quantification of health, gender, climate benefits to SDG scorecards? I'm going to ask um, 
Nikhil to further elaborate on that question, if you will. So I'm going to try to, if I may, if you can bear with me here, um, attend to unmute Nikhil if you are still on the line here. Nikhil, would you care to um, comment further? I, I vote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from what I remember, SDG 3.9.1 uh, is in terms of percentage of households using solid fuels, which means that solid fuels by definition are dirty, and it allows for you know, that metric, but not in terms of a daily. So what would it take to get UN to say that uh, just as uh, CO2 equivalent uh, turns is a metric for alleged climate benefits that a dailies as computed by your consultants are the acceptable uh, you know, uh, health metric for all the countries. I, I see that. Who, who, yeah, who would have to accept your word? That's all. Who will accept our word? Well, I mean, it's um, obviously it's it's clear that it's not um, gold gold standards word. It's a consortium of of experts that you've seen represented here. Um, and the 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 other element is that you know we we are committed to um, you know we've gone through consultation process um, starting with um, the print a principles based consultation. Um, to say, is this a, a valid metric? And then um, through a second consultation process to say, um, is the quantification um, methodology rigorous? Um, so we did consult through that process. Um, we are also committed to continuing to apply the methodology, um, learn from doing and um, improve on it as and when needed. Um, but that, um, in terms of lobbying towards the, uh, to the UN for inclusion on, on SDG indicators, um, that's a, that's an interesting question that, um, I'm not sure that we've, uh, pursued in, in great detail, but might be something, uh, interesting to look at. So this is Sumi. Can I just jump in for a second, Sarah? Please do, Sumi. Oh, yeah, please. Um, sure. So I just wanted to clarify for people who may be a little bit less familiar. So the the when we talk about a dallies here, I think that this is just a way that has been used um, as a short form for really thinking about the number of dallies that can be averted um, by shifting to, to 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 cleaner energy choices. And that dally metric is one that is actually quite well accepted um, by the broader kind of public health community, including. Um, you know, those those at WHO, which really integrates basically two measures, um, you know, the time lost due to premature death, and then also the time that has been spent in in illness as well, in terms of the those two things, the years of life lost, plus the years lived with disability adding up to become that DALI metric. So although that's kind of the, the simple way that, that, it's, that, that we use to kind of capture the potential health benefits. I think that one would then further unpack that to look at kind of changes in, um, in exposure to pollution and then resulting health impacts that you could focus in on. Um, certainly then if you're thinking about the gender, climate or other, or other impacts, you would have different metrics that you would be focusing on that would also kind of feed directly into some of the development goals. Thanks a lot to me. Well, um, we, that brings us to the top of the hour. Um, and I thank everyone for the uh, attention and uh, particularly the, the questions and discussions to follow. As mentioned, we will um, distribute the slides and the recording to everyone who registered and uh, as also mentioned, we'll be publishing a, a broader report that summarizes this as, as well. Um, and 
please feel free. I, I did see a few questions about um, contacts, reaching out to some of us directly. So we'll make that direct contact. Um, we have that logged in the, um, the webinar history. So we're happy to reach out to you on that. So, and please, if other questions come up, other um, insights or opportunities to engage on, on this or other issues, please do feel free to reach out to, to me or to Sumi. And we look forward to for future collaboration with everyone. Thanks very much.